Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already, and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope that this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. All right, let's jump into the message here this morning. With all of the changes I, I shared a couple weeks back with where we're headed as a church and the new facility that we're going to be uh, moving towards, um, I just have been walking through the book of Acts on a personal level, and I've just been studying really the model and the posture of the early church. Like when God was starting to breathe on his people and when the early church was being formed, what did it look like? And there's a, a really a clear spiritual design for our lives personally. I believe a clear blueprint for the way the church should operate and function. And when we talk about being fully surrendered, this new series that we're, that we're opening up the scriptures and looking at, it's, it's really from the perspective of, Lord, what areas of my life have I refused to relinquish control? Is there any area in my life where I'm not fully surrendered to you? Because the mission of our church and the reason that we're, we're, we're really opening up the scripture and walking through the truth of God's word during this series is we're revisiting our values and our vision because if we want to know where we're going, we have to know who we are. And the mission of Keystone Church is to lead people towards a life that's fully surrendered to Jesus, Because the truth is, the more that you and I are surrendered to Christ, the more open we are to what God wants to do in and through us as individuals and our families, then the opportunity that Christ can transform some things in your life, the more that opportunity can actually take place. So last Sunday, we looked at the beginning of the books of Acts the beginning of the book of Acts, and we saw that Jesus is, he establishes his church. It's all about Jesus through and through, our firm foundation is Christ. And then when you move into Acts chapter 2, there's some incredible things that take place. Uh, the day of Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, ignites the church in this miraculous way, and then Peter actually preaches to a large crowd, and 3,000 people get saved in one church service. I mean, I'd say it's a pretty good day. If you're, if you're in church, 3,000 people say, I'm surrendering my life to Christ. Um, I think that's pretty incredible. Now, side note, even before we, we continue to walk through the scripture here, the moment that Peter preached to the 3,000 is actually the greatest moment of redemption in Peter's life. Because up until that point, if you remember, he denied Jesus three times before Christ went to the cross. In fact, Peter was so filled with shame after that moment, he considered himself unworthy to be a follower, unfit to be uh, someone that could be used by God in ministry. In fact, he tried to go back to his old profession after he made that mistake and, and he made that decision and thought that he had blown it, thought that it was over. And Jesus so graciously restores Peter and reminds him of who he is and reminds him, I know that you love me, extends grace into Peter's life, and the most significant moments in Peter's ministry actually came after his greatest moment of personal misery. And why I'm sharing this with you, and why I think it's significant, is the worst mistakes that we've made in our lives, God wants to turn into moments of ministry where people can find hope in Jesus. So for those of you that maybe you've gone through a season, or you've made mistakes and you've immediately disqualified yourself and you said, God, in no way can use my life because this has happened. I want you to know, Peter's life is an example of someone that blew it, that felt like I'm not worthy, God, you can't use me. And yet the most significant impact that Peter made actually came after one of his most personal and powerful failures in his life. God is in the redemption business. I want you to know that. Gesundheit. Um, what we're about to read here in Acts 2 
is the first major summary of the, church act, the church's activity. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. Just listen to the culture that's being formed here. With glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This culture that's being formed in the early part of the church, you could see this spiritual dynamic that's at work. It's the byproduct of healthy church culture is healthy church growth. Before you see the Lord adding to their numbers daily, the Lord had established a unity, a love that was formed within the people that called church home and because of that, what God was doing through that, atmosphere, through that atmosphere and through that culture, God said, I'm going to breathe on this thing and people are going to come to find hope in Christ. If you want to hear a message from me of what I'm desiring, that as we move into a new space here very, very soon, it's that that atmosphere that is described in the book of Acts would be present every single week at Keystone Church. This is so much more than a building. You need to hear me. I know we're moving to a a new space. It's exciting. But the church is people. We are the local church. The church is not four walls. And then, well, if we were not meeting that four walls, we can't have church. No, we could have church wherever there's a body and a group of believers that are gathering together with glad and sincere hearts. And I love the scripture says, and they like to eat food too. It was like, this is like the best life you could possibly be living. You just want to be around one another. There's an innocence. There's a humility at work. It's one of our values as a church. This is the third one that we have. We talked about the first two last week. But this value is that we understand the value of each soul. It's about people matter most. And the reason we say it like this as a church is because this was the relational blueprint that was found in Scripture. This was a part of a healthy spiritual diet that was at work. How many of you have ever tried a fad diet at some point in your life? You've, you tried something to try to lose weight. Nobody wants to admit to it. I'll raise my hand. I've done, I've done it multiple times. Okay, back in the day, so I've got a buddy of mine right now. He's like, I'm on the carnivore diet. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm on the car. I'm like, dude, that was the Atkins diet like 20 years ago. I did that diet. I said, what are you eating right now? He said, I'm eating meat. I'm eating bacon, eggs, and butter. He said, that's all I eat. He goes, and Foster, he goes, I feel great. He said, I've lost like 25 pounds. I was like, yes, but your heart is like screaming, stop. I need some veggies, something. But he's he's convinced. I'm I'm not trying to discourage him not to do it. But I was like, bro, what happens when you want a cookie? Like, what happens when you you, you want a potato? Like, what what are you going to do when if you want a carb at some point in your life, the weight's just going to come back on? He's like, I know, but I've just, I've got got to do this diet right now to lose a little bit of weight. The reality is, we don't need a restrictive diet, we need a balanced diet, and I'm talking about what we need for our spiritual life. We need some balance in our life, and let me prove this to you. Uh, When COVID hit years ago, some people thought, man, it's going to be great because I can get all the church that I need online, from my living room, on my couch, in my pajamas, and, uh, and, and I don't have to go to church and fellowship together. I've got what I need. It's, I've got a screen. I'm good to go. And let me just tell you, if, if you had that paradigm, uh, you were wrong. <laughs> and I don't mean that in the sense that you can't enjoy a service online or catch up if you're traveling or you could watch different services or people, ministers or ministries that you like. All that's good. All that can add to your, your, your spiritual development. I'm just telling you, though, there's no replacement or substitute for fellowshipping together with one another within the context of being a part of a local church. No substitute for the gathering together. 
And for some of us, though, it, this is a hard message because it's, it's countercultural the way some of us are wired. Some of us, maybe our, our, our you know, typical dynamic, we're, just, we're wired to just kind of come in, sit, hear the message, go. We may not want to interact with people as much. Got to get to Cracker Barrel, then get home. Got to watch the game. Whatever your Sunday afternoon routine is, I don't know what it is for you. But for some of us, it's like we're just not, we're not wired to want to have relationships with people or open up our lives or tell them what's actually going on. And I'm just telling you, you're missing out on some of the best parts of church because you weren't created and designed to live life alone. We need one another, and it's a part of a healthy spiritual balance for us to have relationships. I'm going to continue to prove it to you through Scripture, but, you know, when some of us, we were at the building this past week. You saw the video. We're praying over the church and, and writing scriptures on the wall before the walls were painted and, and, and some of the studs and just, hey, what are we declaring that God would do in this space? And one of my favorite passages in all of scriptures is Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 10. It says, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Hear me for a moment. Many people are walking through their Christian life alone, and loneliness is the new social pandemic of our society. I'm just telling you. You don't even need to be a person of faith or a Christ follower to follow and understand the data. It's rampant across the board. We are technically the most connected society uh, that we've ever been, and yet we are the most lonely as people that we've ever become. How do those two things correlate where you could be so connected as humanity? We have all these devices, all this opportunity to socially connect with one another. And yet the the mental health and the loneliness epidemic is at an all-time high. Why is that? It's because this is never going to be able to replace what we have right here. Whether it's inside the walls of church or how you work or how you interact with your friends and your family, there's just no substitute. Technology is an incredible tool. Should we leverage it and and use the best parts of it? Absolutely. I'm not anti-technology at all. I'm just not one to say it's a suitable replacement for relational community. It'll never take the place of what's happening even in this room here this morning. And when we read the New Testament account in Acts, the early church was formed this way, but I want to show you that it was God's relational desire for things to be set in this this way from the very beginning, in the Genesis account. Genesis 2.18, look at this. Before woman was made, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And the concern that the Lord had was, I don't want this guy to be by himself living on his own. He's going to need some help. And if you're a man and you've, you've married a good woman, you know you need a lot of help. And God's like, i gotta have, I got I to bring somebody into this man's life. And the, the Hebrew word for alone in that passage of Scripture literally means separated from others. So God's desire from the beginning of creation is that you and I would not be separated from from one another. And it's hard. I'm just going to tell you this. And some of you, you may know this already. It's hard to navigate this journey of faith and to grow in your walk with the Lord when you're trying to do it just by yourself, isolated in a vacuum, all on your own. Because connecting with people in life giving community, it can be life changing. Jesus actually demonstrated a life of community. And here's what the early church really valued. I want you to see this. We just read it in Acts chapter 2, but it's so powerful. What they valued was the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Now, let's let's call that Sunday service. That's when we're all gathering together right here right now. They gathered, getting together in small groups, breaking bread, a fellowship meal. That could have been theologically a a meal together at a table or it could have been a communion like we just did here this morning and I put serve teams there because there's so much relational community that happens when you take a next step you get involved you say man I, I want to join and I want to help build what God's doing within his church relationships start to form and then prayer 
The early church was birthed and founded in prayer. This could be personal prayer, corporate prayer. I cannot wait because when we move into our new space, we've done uh, seven days of prayer and fasting the last four years as a church, but we've had to do it online. And, and, and we've, 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 we've done the best we can to like engage, but we're, we're going to do it in person at the church this year in January. We're going to do it at 6 a.m. I'm just letting you all know, like, get ready, set your alarm. Just get, you, if you want to pray, we're going to do it together. But, man, what an opportunity that we have to do some things as a church that we've never been able to do before. We want you to experience the presence of Jesus, but we also want you to find relationships with others that have a relationship with Christ as well. The early church understood the need to push back against the temptation of isolation. Because when the early church was formed, they were facing persecution all across the board. They were fighting to to spend time with one another. This wouldn't have been permitted out in the open when the early church was being formed because Christians were being hunted down, executed, killed. So it was like they were just trying to find a place to meet and get together and hang out and eat a meal and and worship the Lord and and, and then hopefully live another day. So the early church, because they were under so much assault and persecution from society, it's like they knew we can't do this by ourselves. We've got to have one another. It wasn't an option. It was a necessity to help protect their faith. And just to remind you, being together, it's a reflection of heaven. Like if you just, let's say you do survive one day, like you're just, you're you're a solo Christian, like, man, I can do it. I don't need anybody foster. I don't believe anything you're saying. And you make it to heaven one day, what the Lord's going to end up doing is he's going to put you next to the most rowdy group of believers that you've ever met forever, for all of eternity. And they're going to be in your house, in your yard, hanging out, and you're, you're not going to help but have to be in relationship with somebody at some time. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. These good deeds that the Scripture is talking about, spurring one another on, in the Greek it means to provoke. It means that you're, 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 you're sharpening one another. You have relationships with each other, so you can just help. Man, you push, keep going, don't quit. We're in this together. It's like I had a friend years ago when I was trying to get disciplined way back when, trying to get to the gym early, and I remember I had a buddy that's like he would call me every morning, or I would call him at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and if one of us was sleeping, it was like, all right, buddy, get, get up, meet me there. And then the whole point was we knew the likelihood of us showing up was much greater if we had some accountability and somebody there to help us, because if we were just left to our own, we may not show up at all. We might just hit the snooze, go back to bed. Even yesterday, as we're serving, I'm listening to different conversations that are taking place, and it was so cool to see. So much more than just painting a wall, which was awesome. But you're hearing these conversations like, man, you know, I just, I, 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 I was having a struggle, like, getting into God's Word and praying, but now I'm in, a, man, I'm in such a, a better spot. It's more consistent. I'm loving, to see, I'm seeing what God's doing, and yeah, I can't wait till the next men's group gets together. And I'm like, hearing these conversations and these relationships that are continuing to be cultivated, and I'm like, this is the church. This is what the Scripture is talking about. You can't stir up Christian love without community and common eternal purpose. If you really want to go back to the very beginning, you can see it in the Old Testament that the community that God was building and how everyday life was playing out, Israel was a tribe. It's referred to as a a collective group of people that God was using and moving and working through. And so when you get rooted, you get planted in a church, when you become a part of a local church, what God was doing and and, and the blueprint that he designed in Acts chapter 2, it's like no longer am I on a solo mission trying to figure this thing out. Man, I am going to get into community. And what you're saying is, Lord, this is my church. This is my family. These are my people. We need one another. Because at some point in your life, if you haven't already experienced this, you're going to walk through a season 
where things are difficult, where you're searching for answers, where you need prayer, where you need encouragement, where you need somebody to show up and have a meal with you, where you need someone to cry with you, pray with you, celebrate with you. And I'm just letting you know, if you don't have the relationships, you can miss out on all the good things that God wants to do. And I am well aware, seasons change, family dynamics are unique in this room. So it may not look the same for each and every one of us. Right? Somebody that has three infant children, it's going to look different from a couple that's single with no kids. For empty nesters or, or people that your, your kids are out of the house, it might look different for you than for a family that's raising teenagers. But I know life is unique to everyone's individual circumstance. I'm just letting you know there's an opportunity for relationships to be built regardless of where you're at in your life. We need Jesus and we need one another. Because God's people define a church because we are the church. We don't want to miss out on this dynamic. I could see it yesterday, and I want to share this, and then we'll get ready to close. You could see people just dreaming as they were walking through the building and walking the property and seeing all the opportunity that there was. to Man, we could have a group here. We could be in this room. There's a fire pit up there. We could... We could hang out, the, the guys could hang out there and start a fire. I was like, you could start a big fire up there, man. A lot. Big fire. And you could see just the excitement, but I could see the wheels turning like, oh, man, we have an opportunity maybe to build some things even on a property that we've never had the opportunity to do here. And, and here's the encouragement, here's the challenge I'm going to ask you to, to, to really step across this line as we move into a new season as a church. If you have what I'm describing, continue to cultivate it. Water it, feed it, prioritize it, because it's good. But my challenge for you is if you feel disconnected or isolated or alone, or maybe you're just concerned that if somebody knows what's really going on in your life, they're going to reject you or turn you away, or you're not going to be welcomed here as a church, I want to let you know that that's a lie from the enemy. And it's actually could be the one thing that's keeping you from engaging in community. Because as a church, man, we're going to stay in exactly who we are right now. The building's not going to change. So we're going to declare the gospel. We're going to stay true to Jesus. We're going to stay true to God's word. We're not going to move off of that foundation. But we want people to come through the doors that are hurting, broken, need healing that are imperfect. The church is not supposed to be filled with perfect people because we are all imperfect and flawed and sinful. We all need Jesus. We all need grace. I am not standing up here even as a pastor saying, man, I've got it all together. No, I need just as much of Jesus and his grace as you do. But if you've never had relational community in the context of church, I'm telling you, you have to have it. Take a step towards it as we go into this new season as a church. For some, it may be attending Connect that's coming up here in a couple weeks. Connect is a great place that we say it's it's really a starting point. If you're new to the church, you don't know what we believe, where to begin, how you can get involved, it's a great opportunity just to hear a little bit more about the, the culture, the vision, the values, the theology of our church. But what's great is we also say, hey, here's how you can take a next step and get connected into a serve group, into life groups, how you could start to use some of the gifts that God's given you to help build the kingdom. I'm just gonna encourage you, if that's you, if you've never taken that step to move towards relational community. Because we gotta be ready when those doors open and new people come through, ready to welcome them, ready to help them find community, help them find Jesus. I don't know how you found your way, how everyone found their way through the doors of Keystone. But I know that if you call this church home, and this is the place that you say, this is my church, and then we are an extension of the vision of what God's building here. And that culture that we read about in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read it again just to remind us what our heart and who we are as a church. Everyone was filled in awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together 
with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I don't know if people are going to get saved every single day at our new facility, but I am praying that the culture would be such that when people walk through the door, they would sense a genuine spirit. I've always visualized it like this. When people walk through the door of church, I know how intimidating it can be because I didn't grow up in church. So a lot of times you walk through the doors and you feel like, I don't know where I'm at, what's going on, where are the bathrooms, are these people are weird, what's happening. And, uh, and, and make no mistake, we do have some weird people that attend this church. <laughs> They're just not allowed to greet at the door. We hide them. But I know what it feels like to come into a place and you feel like I'm an outsider. I, I don't know if, if I, what do I do? How do I, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to act? It's like, man, Jesus would just say, come as you are. You don't need to put on a front. You don't need to try to behave a certain way because we're all broken. We're all in need of a savior. You walk through the doors and, and you, you, you could take a breath. Your, your, your shoulders can come down. It's like, man, I sense God's presence here. Lord, I want more of whatever you have from my life. I just want people to experience a genuine moment with Christ. I want people to find real relationships with Jesus and with one another. Because I know if that kind of a culture is present at Keystone, I do believe that the Lord will add to his church, build his church in Jesus' name. Would you bow your head and close your eyes here for a moment? pray and just believe that if that's you this morning, you've never stepped over that line of taking a step towards getting connected relationally. I pray that you would make a decision in your heart, in your home, where you're at in your situation to, to move towards authentic biblical community because you need it. And again, those that have it, man, help champion it, be an ambassador. We never want to be a church that becomes inward. It's so easy to find a few people that you connect with, that you like being around, that you like talking to every Sunday, and all of those things are great. But we never want to make it an environment where someone that's walking through the doors for the first time doesn't feel like they have a seat around the table. We want it to be like a banquet table where everybody has a space and a place where they can come and join in and be a part of what God's doing. So Lord, I pray that you continue to cultivate that atmosphere at our church. I pray that you'd help us to remember that value that we have when it comes to relationships. And Lord, we know how busy we can become. We know the speed at which life moves. But God, we also know the speed in which loneliness can creep into our soul and how the enemy can lie to us and isolate us and, and, and get us off by ourselves where we feel like, man, I, I, all I'm doing is trying to figure this out and I'm all alone. Lord, we reject that paradigm. We say we need you. We need one another. We need relationships to help, as your scripture says, spur us on towards love and good deeds. We're not going to forsake or take for granted the gathering together. We want more of you. And if you're here this morning, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never accepted that free invitation of salvation that's offered to each and every one of us, where you surrender your life to Christ and say, Jesus, what you have done on the cross through your death, burial, resurrection, I surrender my life to you. Maybe at some point in your life, maybe you made that declaration in your heart, but you're far from, from Jesus. You're not where you want to be in your walk with the Lord. Maybe for some of you, maybe you've never made that decision ever in your life. You've never surrendered your heart to Christ. Either one of those two invitations, if that's you, I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you, but I certainly would love to pray with you here this morning. If you want to say yes to Jesus for the very first time or recommit your life to Christ, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you if that's you here this morning? God, thank you. Thank you. If you 
raised your hand or even if you didn't and you want to pray this prayer. The Bible is very clear. When we surrender our life, when we accept this free gift of salvation that's offered to each and every one of us, there's an inward change that takes place. So what was once dead has been made alive. There's spiritual hope. There's eternal hope because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made and the price that he paid when he shed his blood on the cross. So if you raised your hand, would you pray this prayer where you're at in your seat? Make this personal between you and the Lord. Say, Jesus, right now, I fully surrender my life to you. Jesus, I accept you in my life. I thank you for changing me. I thank you, Lord, for helping me to grow in my knowledge of who you are and what you've done. Help me to find good, godly relationships where I can continue to grow in my walk with you. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you that my life is now yours. Help me to live for you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, every time someone makes a decision, and surrenders their life to Christ. It's something we're celebrating. That happened here this morning. Can we just give God some praise for what he's doing? If you made that decision, I'm just going to encourage you. There's a connect card on the seat around you. You can mark that decision down. You can take it out to our welcome center. Help just give you some resource. Help answer any questions that you have. Help give you some next steps in terms of what we can be, how we can help walk through this decision you and your life as a church. And then I didn't reference it earlier, but if you have a need in your life and there's something we could help answer for you as Keystone, you could fill that out. You can